My name is Stephen Sindoni, and thank you for listening to the Hollow Earth Reveal Part 2. In this broadcast, you'll hear a true account of the Norwegian sailor, Olaf Jansen, who explains how his sloop sailed through an entrance to the Earth's interior at the North Pole. For two years, Jansen lived with the inhabitants of an underground network of colonies who, Emerson writes, were a full 12 feet tall and whose world was lit by a smoky central sun. Their capital city was said to be the original Garden of Eden. While Emerson does not use the name Agartha, later works such as Agartha, Secrets of the Subterranean Cities, have identified the civilization Jansen encountered with Agartha. Olaf Jansen and his father were Norwegian fishermen in the 1800s who, according to their religious mythologies of Odin and Thor, believed in a land beyond the north wind that is populated by a race of giants and is evergreen and lush. On one of their journeys to Franz Joseph land to gather some ivory, they decided under the favorable weather conditions to journey to this unseen land of their forefathers and view it once and for all with their own eyes. The Smoky God catalogs their journey to this hidden land and their dealings with the giant race that inhabits it. It describes the language, culture, and lifestyles of these beings that exist in the marvelous land or perpetual sunlight. Read the Smoky Guard yourself and discover what remains to this day a great unseen mystery. I will now read excerpts of the Smoky God written by Willis George Emerson. It is as notable as any early story about an underground civilization you'll ever hear. My name is Olaf Jansen. I am a Norwegian, although I was born in the little seafaring Russian town of Uleborg on the eastern coast of the Gulf of Bothnia the northern arm of the Baltic Sea. My parents were on a fishing cruise in the Gulf of Bothnia and put into this Russian town of Uteborg at the time of my birth, being the 27th day of October of 1811. My father, Jens Jansen, was born in Rodwick on the Scandinavian coast near the Lofenden Islands, but after marrying made his home at Stockholm because my mother's people resided in that city. When seven years old, I began going with my father on his fishing trips along the Scandinavian coast. Early in life, I displayed an aptitude for books, and at the age of nine years old, was placed in a private school in Stockholm, remaining there until I was 14. After this, I made regular trips with my father on all fishing voyages. My father was a man nearly six feet three in height and weighed over 15 stone a typical Norseman of the most rugged sort, incapable of more endurance than any other man I have ever known. He possessed the gentleness of a woman in tender little ways, yet his determination and willpower were beyond description. His will admitted of no defeat. I was in my 19th year when we started on what proved to be our last trip as fishermen, and which resulted in a strange story that shall be given to the world, but not until I have finished my earthly pilgrimage. I dare not allow the facts as I know them to be published while I am living for fear of further humiliation, confinement, and suffering. First of all, I was put in irons by the captain of the whaling vessel that rescued me for no other reason than that I told the truth about the marvelous discoveries made by my father and myself. But this was far from being the end of my tortures. After four years and eight months' absence, I reached Stockholm only to find my mother had died the previous year and the property left by my parents in the possession of my mother's people, but it was at once made over to me. All might have been well had I erased from my memory the story of our adventure and of my father's terrible death. Finally, one day, I told the story in detail to my uncle Gustav Osterlund, a man of considerable property, and urged him to fit out an expedition for me to make another voyage to the strange land. At first, I thought he favored my project. He seemed interested and invited me to go before certain officials and explain to them, as I had to him, the story of our travels and discoveries. Imagine my disappointment and horror when, upon the conclusion of my narrative, certain papers were signed by my uncle, and without warning, I found myself arrested 
and hurried away to dismissal and fearful confinement in a madhouse where I remained for twenty-eight years, long, tedious, frightful years of suffering. I never ceased to assert my sanity and to protest against the injustices of my confinement. Finally, on the 17th of October, 1862, I was released. My uncle was dead, and the friends of my youth were now strangers. Indeed, a man of over 50 years old, whose only known record is that of a madman, has no friends. I was at a loss to know what to do for a living, but instinctively turned towards the harbor where fishing boats in great numbers were anchored, and within a week I had shipped with a fisherman by the name of Jan Hansen, who was starting on a long fishing cruise to the Lofenden Islands. Here my earlier years of training proved of the very greatest advantage, especially in enabling me to make myself useful. That was but the beginning of other trips, and by frugal economy I was, in a few years, able to own a fishing brig of my own. For twenty-seven years thereafter I followed the sea as a fisherman, five years working for others, and the last twenty-two for myself. During all these years, I was a most diligent student of books, as well as a hard worker at my business, but I took great care not to mention to anyone the story concerning the discoveries made by my father and myself. Even at this late day, I would be fearful of having anyone see or know the things I am writing and the records and maps I have in my keeping. When my days on earth are finished, I shall leave maps and records that will enlighten and I hope benefit mankind. The memory of my long confinement with maniacs and all the horrible anguish and sufferings are too vivid to warrant my taking further chances. In 1889 I sold out my fishing boats and found I had accumulated a fortune quite sufficient to keep me the remainder of my life. I then came to America. For a dozen years my home was in Illinois near Batavia where I gathered most of the books in my present library, though I brought many choice volumes from Stockholm. Later I came to Los Angeles, arriving here March 4, 1901, the day that I will remember as it was President McKinley's second inauguration day. I bought this humble home and determined, here in the privacy of my own abode, sheltered by my own vine and fig tree and with my books about me, to make maps and drawings of the new lands we had discovered and also to write the story in detail from the time my father and I left Stockholm until the tragic event that parted us in the Antarctic Ocean. I will remember that we left Stockholm in our fishing sloop on the third day of April 1829 and sailed to the southward, leaving Gothland Island to the left and Olin Island to the right. A few days later we succeeded in doubling Sandomar Point and we made our way through the sound which separates Denmark from the Scandinavian coast. In due time, we put in at the town of Christensand, where we rested two days, and then started around the Scandinavian coast to the westward, bound for the Lofenden Islands. My father was in high spirits because of the excellent and gratifying returns he had received from our last catch by marketing at Stockholm instead of selling at one of the seafaring towns along the Scandinavian coast. He was especially pleased with the sale of some ivory tusks that he had found on the west coast of Franz Joseph Land during one of his northern cruises the previous year, and he expressed the hopes that this time we might again be fortunate enough to load our little fishing sloop with ivory instead of cod, herring, mackerel, and salmon. We put in in Hammerfest, latitude 71 degrees and 40 minutes, for a few days' rest. Here we remained one week, laying in an extra supply of provisions and several casks of drinking water, and then sailed towards Spitsbergen. For the first few days we had an open sea and a favoring wind, and then we encountered much ice and many icebergs. A vessel larger than our own fishing sloop could not possibly have threaded its way along the labyrinth of icebergs or squeezed through barely open channels. These monster bergs presented an endless succession of crystal palaces of massive cathedrals and fantastic mountain ranges, grim and sentinel-like, immovable as some towering cliff of solid rock, standing silent as a sphinx, resisting the restless waves of a fretful sea. After many narrow escapes, we arrived at Spitzenberg on the 23rd of June and anchored at Wijay Bay for a short time, where we were quite successful in our catches. We then lifted anchor and sailed through the 
Hinn opened straight and coasted along the northeast land. A strong wind came up from the southwest, and my father said that we had better take advantage of it and try to reach Franz Joseph Land, where the year before he had, by accident, found the ivory tusks that had brought him such a good price at Stockholm. Never before or since have I seen so many seafowl. They were so numerous that they hid the rocks on the coastline and darkened the sky. For several days, we sailed along the rocky coast of Franz Josef Land. Finally, a favoring wind came up that enabled us to make the west coast, and after sailing 24 hours, we came to a beautiful inlet. One could hardly believe it was the far north land. The place was green with growing vegetation, and while the area did not comprise more than one or two acres, yet the air was warm and tranquil. It seemed to be at a point where the Gulf Stream influences is most keenly felt. On the east coast there were numerous icebergs, yet here we were in open waters. Far to the west of us, however, were ice packs, and still farther to the westward the ice appeared like ranges of low hills. In front of us, and directly to the north, lay an open sea. My father was an ardent believer in Odin and Thor, and frequently told me that they were gods who came from far beyond the north wind. There was a tradition, my father explained, that still farther northward was a land more beautiful than any mortal had ever known, and that it was inhabited by the chosen. My youthful imagination was fired by the ardor, zeal, and religious fervor of my good father, and I exclaimed, Why not sail to this goodly land? The sky is fair, the wind is favorable, and the sea open. Even now I see the expression of my pleasurable surprise of his consonance as he turned toward and asked, my son, are you willing to go with me and explore, to go far beyond where man has ever ventured? I answered affirmatively. Very well, he replied. May the god Odin protect us. And quickly adjusting the sails, he glanced at our compass, turned the prow in due northerly direction to an open channel, and our voyage had begun. The sun was low on the horizon, and it was still the early summer. Indeed, we had almost four months of day ahead of us, before the frozen night would come again. Our little shipping sloop sprang forward as if eager as ourselves for adventure. Within 36 hours we were out of sight of the highest point on the coastline of Franz Joseph Land. We seemed to be in strong current running north by northeast. Far to the right and to the left of us were icebergs, but our little sloop bore down on the narrows and passed through channels and out into open sea channels, so narrow in places that our craft had been any other craft we would never have gotten through. On the third day we came to an island. Its shores were washed by an open sea. My father determined to land and explore for a day. This new land was destitute of timber, but we found a large accumulation of driftwood on the northern shore. Some of the trunks of the trees were 40 feet long and 2 feet in diameter. I remember that neither my father nor myself had tasted food for almost 30 hours. Perhaps this was because of the tension of excitement about our strange voyage and waters farther north, my father said, than anyone had ever before seen. Active mentality had dulled the demands of the physical needs. Instead of the cold being intense as we had anticipated, it was really warmer and more pleasant than it had been in Hammerfest on the North Sea of Norway some six weeks before. We both frankly admitted that we were very hungry, and forthwith I prepared a substantial meal from our well-stored larder. When we had partaken heartily of the repast, I told my father I believed I would sleep as I was beginning to feel quite drowsy. Very well, he replied, I will keep this watch. I have no way to determine how long I slept. I only know that I was rudely awakened by a terrible commotion of the sloop. To my surprise, I found my father sleeping soundly. I cried out lustily to him and started up. He sprang quickly to his feet. Indeed, had he not instantly clutched the rail, he would certainly have been thrown into the seething waves. A fierce snowstorm was raging. The wind was directly astern, driving our sloop at a terrific speed, and was threatening every moment to capsize us. There was no time to lose. The sails had to be lowered immediately. Our boat was withering in convulsions. A few icebergs we knew were our 
on either side of us, but fortunately the channel was open directly to the north. But would it remain so? In front of us, girdling the horizon was from left to right was a vaporish fog or mist, black as Egyptian night at the water's edge, and white like a steam cloud toward the top. A fierce snowstorm was raging. The wind was directly astern, driving our sloop at a terrific speed, and was threatening every moment to capsize us. There was no time to lose. The sails had to be lowered immediately. Our boat was withering in convulsions. A few icebergs we knew were on either side of us, but fortunately the channel was open directly to the north. But would it remain so? In front of us, girdling the horizon was from left to right was a vaporish fog or mist black as Egyptian night at the water's edge, and white like a steam cloud toward the top, which was finally lost to view as it blended with the great white flakes of falling snow, whether it covered a treacherous iceberg or some other hidden obstacle against which our little sloop would dash and send us to a watery grave, or was it merely the phenomenon of an arctic fog there was no way to determine. By what miracle we escaped being dashed to utter destruction, I do not know. I remember our little craft creaked and groaned as if its joints were breaking. It rocked and staggered to and fro as if clutched by some fierce undertow of whirlwind or maelstrom. Fortunately, our compass had been fastened with long screws to a crossbeam. Most of our provisions, however, were tumbled out and swept away from the deck of the cuddy. And had we not taken the precaution at the very beginning to tie ourselves firm to the mass of that sloop, we should have been swept into the lashing sea. After the deafening tumult of the raging waves, I heard my father's voice. Be courageous, my son, he shouted. Odin is the god of the waters, the compassion of the brave, and he is with us, fear not. To me it seemed there was no possibility of our escaping a horrible death. The little sloop was shipping water, the snow was falling so fast as to be blinding, and the waves were tumbling over our counters in reckless white spraying fury. There was no telling what instant we should be dashed against some drifting ice pack. The tremendous swells would heave us to the very peaks of mountainous waves, then plunge us down to the depths of the sea's trough as if our fishing sloop were a fragile shell. Gigantic white cap waves like veritable walls fenced us in fore and aft. This terrible nerve-wracking ordeal with its nameless horrors of suspense and agony, of fear indestructible, continued for more than three hours and all this time we were being driven through at fierce speed. Then suddenly, as if growing weary of its frantic exertions, the wind began to lessen its fury and by degrees to die down. At least we were in perfect calm. The fog mist had also disappeared, and before us lay an iceless channel perhaps 10 or 15 miles wide with a few icebergs far to our right and an intermittent archipelago of smaller ones to the left. I watched my father closely, determined to remain silent until he spoke. Presently he united the rope from his waist and, without saying a word, began working the pumps, which he fortunately were not damaged, relieving the sloop of the water it had shipped in the madness of the storm. He put up the sloop's sails as calmly as if casting a fishing net, and then remarked that we were ready to, for a favoring wind when it came. His courage and persistence were truly remarkable. On investigation, we found less than one-third of our provisions remaining, while to our utter dismay we discovered that our water casks had been swept overboard during the violent plunging of our boat. Two of our water casks were in the main hold, but both were empty. We had a fair supply of food, but no fresh water. I realized at once the awfulness of our position. Presently, I was seized with a consuming thirst. It is indeed bad, remarked my father. However, let us dry our bedraggled clothing for we are soaked to the skin. Trust to the god Odin, my son. Do not give up hope. The sun was beating down slantingly, as if we were in a northern latitude instead of being in the far northland. It was swinging around, its orbit ever visible, and rising higher and higher each day, frequently miscovered, yet always peering through the lacework of clouds like some fretful eye of fate guarding the mysterious northland and jealously watching the pranks of man. Far to our right, the rays decking the prisms of icebergs were gorgeous. Their reflection emitted flashes of garnet of diamonds of sapphire, a pyrotechnic panorama of countless colors and shapes, while below could be seen the green-tinted sea, and above 
the purple sky. I tried to forget my thirst by busying myself with bringing up some food in an empty vessel from the hold. Reaching over the side rail, I filled the vessel with water for the purpose of laving my hands and face. To my astonishment, when the water came in contact with my lips, I could taste no salt. I was startled by the discovery. Father, I fairly gasped. The water, the water, it is fresh. What, Olive? exclaimed my father, glancing hastily around. Surely you are mistaken. There is no land. You are going mad. But taste it, I cried. And thus we made the discovery that the water was indeed fresh, absolutely so, without the least briny taste or even the suspicion of a salty flavor. We forthwith filled our remaining two casks, and my father declared it was a heavenly dispensation of mercy from the gods Odin and Thor. We were almost beside ourselves with joy, but hunger bade us end our forced fast. Now that we had found fresh water in the open sea, what might we not expect in this strange latitude where ships had never before sailed, and the splash of an oar had never been heard. We had scarcely appeased our hunger when a breeze began, filling the idle sails, and glancing at the compass we found the northern point pressing hard against the glass. In response to my surprise, my father said, I have heard of this before. It is what they call the dipping of the needle. We loosened the compass and turned it at right angles with the surface of the sea before its point would free itself from the glass and point accordingly to unmolested attraction. It shifted uneasily and seemed as unsteady as a drunken man, but finally pointed to a course. Before this we thought the wind was carrying us north by northwest, but with the needle free we discovered, if it could be relied upon, that we were sailing slightly north by northeast. Our course, however, was ever tending northward. The sea was serenely smooth with hardly a choppy wave, and the wind brisk and exhilarating. The sun's rays were striking a slant, furnishing tranquil warmth, and thus time wore on day after day, and we found from the record in our logbook we had been sailing eleven days since the storm in the open sea. By strictest economy our food was holding out fairly well, but beginning to run low. In the meantime, one of our casks of water had been exhausted, and my father said, We will fill it again. But to our dismay, we found the water was now as salt as in the region of the Lofoden Islands off the coast of Norway. This necessitated our being extremely careful of the remaining cask. I found myself wanting to sleep much of the time, whether it was the effect of the exciting experience of sailing in unknown waters or the relaxation from the awful excitement incident to our adventure in a storm at sea or due to want of food, I could not say. I frequently lay down on the bunker of our little sloop and looked far up into the blue dome of the sky, and notwithstanding the sun was shining far away in the east, I always saw a single star overhead. For several days when I looked for this star, it was always there directly above us. It was now, according to our reckoning, about the first of August. The sun was high in the heavens and was so bright that I could no longer see the lone star that attracted my attention a few days earlier. One day about this time my father startled me by calling my attention to a novel sight far in front of us, almost at the horizon. It is a mock sun, exclaimed my father. I have read of them. It is called a reflection of mirage. It will soon pass away. But this dull red false sun, as we supposed it to be, did not pass away for several hours and while we were unconscious of its emitting any rays of light, still there was no time thereafter where we could not sweep the horizon in front and locate the illumination of the so-called false sun during a period of at least 12 hours out of every 24. Clouds of mist would at times almost, but never entirely, hide its location. Gradually it seemed to climb higher in the horizon of the uncertain purple sky as we advanced. It could hardly be said to resemble the sun except in its circular shape, and when not obscured by clouds or the ocean mists, it had a hazy red-bronze appearance which would change to a white light like a luminous cloud, as if reflecting some greater light beyond. We finally agreed in our discussion of this smoky furnace-colored sun that whatever the cause of the phenomenon, it was not a reflection of our sun but a planet of some sort, a reality. 
One day soon after this, I felt exceedingly drowsy and fell into a sound sleep. But it seemed that I was almost immediately aroused by my father's vigorous shaking of me by the shoulder and saying, Olaf, awaken, there is land in sight. I sprang to my feet. Oh, joy unspeakable. There, far in the distance, yet directly in our path, were lands jutting boldly into the sea. The shoreline stretched far away to the right of us, as far as the eye could see, and all along the sandy beach were waves breaking into choppy foam, receding, then going forward again, ever chanting in monotonous thunder tones the songs of the deep. The banks were covered with trees and vegetation. I cannot express my feelings of exultation at this discovery. My father stood motionless with his hands on the tiller looking straight ahead, pouring out his heart in thankful prayer and thanksgiving to the gods, Odin and Thor. In the meantime, a net which we found in the stowage had been cast, and we caught a few fish that materially added to our dwindling stock of provisions. The compass which we had fastened back in its place in fear of another storm was still pointing due north and moving on its pivot just as it had at Stockholm. The dipping of the needle had ceased. What could this mean? Then, too, our many days of sailing had certainly carried us past the North Pole, and yet the needle continued to point north. We were sorely perplexed, but surely our direction was now south. We sailed for three days along the shoreline, then came to the mouth of a jord or, or river of immense size. It seemed more like a great bay, and into this we turned our fishing craft, the direction being slightly northeast of south. By the assistance of a fretful wind that came to our aid about 12 hours out of 24 hours, we continued to make our way inland into what afterward proved to be a mighty river and which we learned was called by the inhabitants Hittikil. We continued our journey for 10 days thereafter and found we had fortunately attained a distance inland where ocean tides no longer affected the water which had become fresh. Discovery came none too soon, for our remaining cask of water was well nigh exhausted. We lost no time in replenishing our casks and continued to sail farther up the river where the wind was favorable. Along the banks, great forests miles in extent could be seen stretching away on the shoreline. The trees were of enormous size. We landed after anchoring near a sandy beach and waded ashore and were rewarded by finding a quantity of nuts that were palatable and satisfying to hunger and a welcome change from the monotony of our stock of provisions. It was about the first of September, our five months we calculated since our leave taking from Stockholm. Suddenly we were frightened almost out of our wits by hearing in the far distance the singing of people. Very soon thereafter we discovered a huge ship gliding down the river directly towards us. Those aboard were singing in one mighty chorus that echoing from bank to bank sounded like a thousand voices filling the whole universe with quivering melody. The accompaniment was played on stringed instruments not unlike our harps. It was a larger ship than any we had ever seen and was differently constructed. At this particular time our sloop was becalmed and not far from the shore. The bank of the river, covered with mammoth trees, rose up several hundred feet in beautiful fashion. We seemed to be on the edge of some primal forest that doubtlessly stretched far inland. The immense craft paused, and almost immediately a boat was lowered, and six men of gigantic stature rowed to our little fishing sloop. They spoke to us in a strange language. We knew from their manner, however, that they were not unfriendly. They talked a great deal among themselves, and one of them laughed immoderately, as though in finding us was a queer discovery had been made. One of them spied our compass, and it seemed to interest them more than any other part of our sloop. Finally, the leader motioned as if to ask whether we were willing to leave our craft to go on board their ship. What would you say, my son, asked my father. They cannot do any more than kill us. They seem to be kindly disposed, I replied, although, what terrible giants. They must be the select six of the kingdom's crack regiment. Just look at their great size.
We may as well go willingly as to be taken by force, said my father, smiling, for they are certainly able to capture us. Thereupon he made known by signs that we were ready to accompany them. Within a few minutes we were on board the ship, and half an hour later our little fishing craft had been lifted bodily out of the water by a strange sort of hook and tackle and set on board as a curiosity. There were several hundred people on board this, to us, mammoth ship, which we discovered was called a Naz, meaning, as we were afterward learned, pleasure or, to give a more proper interpretation, pleasure excursion ship. If my father and I were curiously observed by the ship's occupants, this strange race of giants offered us an equal amount of wonderment. There was not a single man on board who would not have measured fully twelve feet in height. They all wore beards, not particularly long, but seemingly short-cropped. They had mild and beautiful faces, exceedingly fair with ruddy complexions. Their hair and beard of some were black, others sandy, and still others yellow. The captain, as we designated the dignitary in command of the great vessel, was fully a head taller than any of his companions. The woman's averaged from ten to twelve feet in height. Their features were especially regular and refined, while their complexion was of a most delicate tint, heightened by a healthy glow. Both men and women seemed to possess their particular ease of manner, which deemed a sign of good breeding, and notwithstanding their huge statures, there was nothing about them suggesting awkwardness. As I was a lad in only my nineteenth year, I was doubtlessly looked upon as a true Tom Thumb. My father, six feet three, did not lift the top of his head above the waistline of these men. Each one seemed to vie with the other in extending courtesies and showing kindness to us, but all laughed heartily. I remember when they had to improvise chairs for my father and myself to sit at tables. They were richly attired in a costume particular to themselves and very attractive. The men were clothed in handsomely embroidered tunics of silk and satin and belted at the waist. They wore knee breeches and stockings of a fine texture, while their feet were encased in sandals adorned with gold buckles. We early discovered that gold was one of the most common metals known and that was used extensively in decoration. Strange as it may seem, neither my father nor myself felt the least bit of solicitude for our safety. We have come into our own, my father said to me. This is the fulfillment of the tradition told to me by my father and my father's father and still back for many generations of our race. This is assuredly the land beyond the north wind. We seemed to make such an impression on the party that we were given specialty into the charge of one of the men, Jules Galdia, and his wife, for the purpose of being educated in their language, and we, on our part, were just as eager to learn as they were to instruct. At the captain's command, the vessel was swung cleverly about and began retracing its course up the river. The machinery, while noiseless, was very powerful. The banks and trees on either side seemed to brush by. The ship's speed at times surpassed that of any railroad train on which I had ever ridden. Even here in America, it was wonderful. In the meantime, we had lost sight of the sun's rays, but we found a radiance within emanating from the dull red sun which had already attracted our attention, now giving out a white light seemingly from a cloud bank far away in front of us. It dispensed a greater light I should say then, two full moons on the clearest night. In twelve hours this cloud of whiteness would pass out of sight as if eclipsed, and the twelve hours following corresponded with our night. We early learned that these strange people were worshippers of the great cloud of night. It was the smoky god of the inner world. The ship was equipped with a mode of illumination which I now presume was electricity but neither my father nor myself was sufficiently skilled in mechanics to understand whence came the power to operate the ship or to maintain this soft, beautiful lights that answered the same purpose of our present methods of lighting the streets of our cities, our houses, and places of business. It must be remembered the time of which I write was the autumn of 1829, and we of the outside surface of the world knew nothing then, so to speak, of electricity. 
The electrically supercharged condition of the air was a constant vitalizer. I never felt better in my life than during the two years my father and I sojourned on the inside of the earth. To resume my narrative of events, the ship on which we were sailing came to a stop two days after we had taken on board. My father said as nearly as he could judge, we were directly under Stockholm or London. The city we had reached was called Jehu, signifying a seaport town. The houses were large and beautifully constructed and quite uniform in appearance, yet without sameness. The principal occupation of the people appeared to be agriculture. The hillsides were covered with vineyards, while the valleys were devoted to the growing of grain. I never saw such a display of gold. It was everywhere. The door casings were inlaid and the tables were veneered with sheetings of gold. Domes of the public buildings were of gold. They were used most generously in the furnishings of the great temples of music. Vegetation grew in lavish exuberance, and fruits of all kinds possessed the most delicate flavor. Clusters of grapes four and five feet in length, each grape as large as an orange, and apples larger than a man's head, typifying the wonderful growth of all things on the inside of the earth. The great redwood trees of California would be considered mere underbrush compared with the giant forest trees extending for miles and miles in all directions. In many directions along the foothills of the mountains, vast herds of cattle were seen during the last days of our travel on the river. We heard much of a city called Eden, but were kept at Jehu for an entire year. By the end of that time, we had learned to speak fairly well the language of this strange race of people. Our instructors, Jules Galdia and his wife, exhibited a patience that was truly commendable. One day an envoy from the ruler at Eden came to us and for two whole days my father and myself were put through a series of surprising questions. They wished to know from whence we came, what sort of people dealt without, what God we worship, our religious beliefs, the mode of living in our strange land, and a thousand other things. The compass which we had brought with us attracted especial attention. My father and I commented between ourselves on the fact that the compass still pointed north, although we now knew we had sailed over the curve or edge of the Earth's aperture and were far along southward on the inside surface of the Earth's crust, which, according to my father's estimates of my own, is about 300 miles in thickness from the inside to the outside surface. Relatively speaking, it is no thicker than an eggshell, so that there is almost as much surface on the inside as on the outside of the earth. The great luminous cloud or ball of dull red fire, fiery red in the mornings and evenings, and during the day giving off a beautiful white light, the smoky god, is seemingly suspended in the center of the great vacuum within the earth, and held to its place by the immutable law of gravitation, or a repellent atmospheric force. As the case may be, I refer to the known power that draws or repels with equal force in all directions. The base of this electrical cloud or central luminary, the seat of the gods, is dark and non-transparent, save for innumerable small openings seemingly in the bottom of the great support or altar of the deity upon which the smoky god rests, and the lighting shining through these many openings twinkle at night in all their splendor, and seem to be stars as natural as the stars we saw shining when in our home at Stockholm, excepting that they appear larger. The smoky god, therefore, with each daily revolution of the earth, appears to come up in the east and go down in the west, the same as does our sun on the external surface. In reality, the people within believe that the smoky god is the throne of their Jehovah and is stationary. The effect of night and day is therefore produced by the Earth's daily rotation. I have since discovered that the language of the people of the inner world is much like the Sanskrit. After we had given an account of ourselves to emissaries from the central seat of government of the inner continent, and my father had in his crude way drawn maps at their request of the outside surface of the Earth, showing the dimensions of land and water, and giving the names of each of the continents, large islands, and the oceans, we were taken overland to the city of Eden in a conveyance different from anything we have in Europe or America. 
This vehicle was doubtless some electrical contravance. It was noiseless and ran on a single iron rail in perfect balance. The trip was made at a very high rate of speed. We were carried up hills and down dales, across valleys and along the sides of steep mountains with any apparent attempt having made to level the earth as we do for railroad tracks. The car seats were huge yet comfortable affairs and very high above the floors of the car. On the top of each car were highly geared flywheels on their sides, which were so automatically adjusted that, as the speed of the car increased, the high speed of these flywheels geometrically increased. Jules Galdia explained to us that these revolving fan-like wheels on top of the cars destroyed atmospheric pressure, or what is generally understood by the term as gravitation, and with this force thus destroyed or rendered nugatory, the car is as safe from falling to one side or the other from the single rail track as if it were in a vacuum. The flywheels in their rapid revolutions destroying effectively the so-called power of gravitation or the force of atmospheric pressure or whatever important influence it may be that causes all unsupported things to fall downward to the earth's surface or the nearest point of resistance. The surprise of my father and myself was indescribable when amid the regal magnificence of a spacious hall we were finally brought before the great high priest, ruler of, of all the land. He was richly robed and much taller than those about him and could not have been less than 14 or 15 feet in height. The immense room in which we were received seemed finished in solid slabs of gold, highly studded with jewels of amazing brilliancy. The city of Eden is located in what seems to be a beautiful valley, yet in fact it is on the loftiest mountain plateau of the inner continent, several thousand feet higher than any portion of the surrounding country. It is the most beautiful place I have ever beheld in all my travels. In this elevated garden, all manners of fruits, vines, shrubs, trees, and flowers grow in riotous profusion. In this garden, four rivers have their source in a mighty artisan fountain. They divide and flow in four directions. This place is called by the inhabitants the navel of the earth, or the beginning, the cradle of the human race. The names of the rivers are the Euphrates, the Pison, the Gihon, and the Hittical. The unexpected awaited us in the Palace of Beauty. In the finding of our little fishing craft, it had been brought before the high priest in perfect shape, just as it had been taken from the waters the day when it was loaded on board the ship by the people who discovered us on the river more than a year before. We were given an audience of over two hours with this great dignitary who seemed kindly disposed and considerate. He showed himself eagerly interested, asking us numerous questions and invariably regarding things about which his emissaries had failed to inquire. At the conclusion of the interview, he inquired our pleasure, asking us whether we wished to remain in his country or if we preferred to return to the outer world, providing it were possible to make a successful return trip across the frozen belt barriers that encircle both the northern and southern openings of the earth. My father replied, it would please me and my son to visit your country and see your people, your colleges and palaces of music and art, your great fields, your wonderful forests of timber, and after we have had this pleasurable privilege, we would like to try to return to our home on the outside surface of the earth. This son is my only child, and my good wife will be very weary waiting our return. I fear you can never return, replied the chief high priest, because the way is a most hazardous one. However, you shall visit the different cities with Jules Galdia as your escort, and be accorded every courtesy and kindness. Whenever you are ready to attempt the return voyage, I assure you that your boat, which is here on exhibition, shall be put in the waters of the river Hittical at its mouth, and we will bid you Jehovah's speed, thus terminating our interview with the high priest or ruler of the continent. We learned that the males do not marry before they are from 75 to 100 years old, and that the age at which women enter wedlock is only a little less, and that both men and women frequently live to be from six to eight hundred years old, and in some instances much older. During the following year we visited many villages and towns, prominent among them being the cities of Nagai, Delphi, Hectia, and my father was called upon no less than a half dozen times to go over the maps which had been made from the rough sketches that he had originally given on the, of the divisions of land and water on the outside surface of the earth. I remember hearing my father remark that the giant race of people in the land of the Smoky God 
had almost an accurate an idea of the geography of the outside surface of the earth as had the average college professor in Stockholm. In our travels we came to a forest of gigantic trees near the city of Delphi. Had the Bible said there were trees towering over 300 feet in height and more than 30 feet in diameter growing in the Garden of Eden, the Ingersolls, the Tom Paines, and Voltaire's would doubtlessly have pronounced the statement a myth. Yet this is the description of the California sequoia. But these California trees pale into insignificance when, which was at least two feet in length and 15 inches in diameter. After we had been in the city of Hectia about a week, a pr Professor Galdia took us to an inlet where we saw hundreds of tortoises along the sandy shore. I hesitate to state the size of these giant creatures. They were 25 to 30 feet in length, from 15 to 20 feet in width, and fully 7 feet in height. When one of these projected its head, it had the appearance of some hideous sea monster. The strange conditions within are favorable not only for vast meadows of luxuriant grasses, forests of giant trees, and all manners of vegetable life, but wonderful animal life as well. One day we heard a great herd of elephants. They must have been 500 of these thunder-throated monsters with their restlessly waving trunks. They were tearing huge burrows from the trees and trampling smaller growth into dust like so much hazel brush. They would average over 100 feet in length and from 75 to 85 feet in height. It seemed as I gazed upon this wonderful herd of giant elephants that I was living in the public library of Stockholm where I had spent much time studying the wonders of the, the Miocene age. I was filled with mute astonishment and my father was speechless with awe. He held my arm with a protecting grip as if fearful harm would overtake us. We were two atoms in this giant forest and fortunately unobserved by this vast herd of elephants as they drifted on and away following a leader as does a herd of sheep. They browsed from growing herbage, which they encountered as they traveled, and on and again shook the firmament with their deep bellowing. There is a hazy mist that goes up from the land each evening, and it invariably rains once every 24 hours. This great moisture and the invigorating electrical light and warmth account perhaps for luxuriant vegetation, while the highly charged electrical air and the evenness of climatic conditions may have much to do with the giant growth and longevity of all animal life. In places the level valleys stretched away for many miles in every direction. The smoky god in its clear white light looked calmly down. There was an intoxication in the electrically supercharged air that fanned the cheek as softly as a vanishing whisper. Nature chanted a lullaby in the faint murmur of winds whose breath was sweet with the fragrance of bud and blossom. After having spent considerably more than a year in visiting several of the many cities of the within world and a great deal of intervening country, and more than two years had passed from the time we had been picked up by the great excursion ship on the river, we decided to cast our fortunes once more upon the sea and endeavor to, to regain the outside surface of the earth. We made known our wishes and they were reluctantly, were promptly followed. Our host gave my father at his request various maps showing the entire inside surface of the earth, its cities, oceans, seas, rivers, gulfs, and bays. They also generously offered to give us all the bags of gold nuggets, some of them as large as goose eggs, that we were willing to attempt to take with us in our little fishing boat. In due time we returned to Jehu, at which place we spent one month in fixing up and overhauling our little fishing sloop. After all was in readiness, the same ship Naz that originally discovered us took us on board and sailed to the mouth of the river Hittical. After our giant brothers had launched our little craft for us, they were mostly cordially regretful at parting. My father swore by the gods Odin and Thor that he would surely return again within a year or two and pay them another visit, and thus we bade them adieu. We made ready and hoisted our sail, but there was a little breeze. We would be calm within one hour after our giant friends had left, and we started then on our return trip home. The winds were constantly blowing south, that is, 
they were blowing from the northern opening of the earth toward that which we knew to be south, but which according to our compasses, pointing finger, was directly north. For three days we tried to sail and to beat against the wind, but to no avail. Whereupon my father said, My son, to return by the same route as we came is impossible at this time of the year. I wonder why we did not think of this before. We have been here almost two and a half years, therefore this is the season when the sun is beginning to shine in at the southern opening of the earth. The long cold night is on the Spitzenberg country. What shall we do? I inquired. There is only one thing we can do, my father replied, and that is to go south. Accordingly, he turned the craft about, gave it full reef, and started by the compass north, but in fact directly south. The wind was strong, and we seemed to have struck a current that was running with remarkable swiftness in the same direction. In just forty days we arrived at Delphi, a city we had visited in company with our guides, Jules Galdier and his wife, near the mouth of the Gihon River. Here we stopped for two days, and were most hospitably entertained by the same people who had welcomed us on our former visit. We laid in some additional provisions and again set sail, following the needle due north. On our outward trip, we came through a narrow channel which appeared to be a separated body of water between two considerable bodies of land. There was a beautiful beach to our right, and we decided to reconnoiter. Casting anchor, we waited ashore to rest for a few days before continuing the outward hazardous undertaking. We built a fire and threw on some stick of dry driftwood. While my father was walking along the shore, I prepared a tempting repast from supplies we had provided. There was a mild luminous light which my father said resulted from the sun shining in from the south aperture of the earth. That night we slept soundly and awakened the next morning as refreshed as if we had been in our own beds in Stockholm. After breakfast we started out on an inland tour of discovery, but had not gone far when we sighted some birds which we recognized at once as belonging to the penguin family. They are flightless birds, but excellent swimmers and tremendous in size with white breasts, short wings, black head, and long beaked bills. They stand fully nine feet high. They look at us with little surprise and presently waddle rather than walk toward the water and swam away in a northerly direction. The events that occurred during the following hundred or more days beguard description. We went on an open and iceless sea, the month we reckoned to be November or December, and we knew the so-called South Pole was turned toward the sun. Therefore, when passing out and away from the internal electrical light of the smoky guard and its genial warmth, we would be met by the light and warmth of the sun shining in through the south opening of the earth. We were not mistaken. There were times when our little craft, driven by wind that was continuous and persistent, shot through the waters like an arrow. Indeed, had we encountered a hidden rock or obstacle, our little vessel would have been crushed into kindling wood. At last we were conscious that the atmosphere was growing decidedly colder and a few days later icebergs were sighted far to the left. My father argued incorrectly that the winds which filled our sails came from the warm climate within. The time of the year was certainly most suspicious for us to make our dash from the outside world and attempt to scud our fishing sloop through open channels of the frozen zone which surrounds the polar regions. We were soon amid the ice packs and how our little craft got through the narrow channels and escaped being crushed, I know not. The compass behaved in the same drunken and unreliable fashion in passing over the southern curve or edge of the Earth's shell as it had done on our inward trip at the northern entrance. It gyrated, dipped, and seemed like a thing possessed. One day as I lazily looking over the sloop side into the clear waters, my father shouted, Breaker ahead! Looking up, I saw through a lifting mist a white object that towered several hundred feet, completely shutting off our advance. We lowered sail immediately, and none too soon. In a moment we found ourselves wedged between two monstrous icebergs. Each was crowding and grinding against its fellow mountain of ice. They were like two gods of war contending for supremacy. We were greatly alarmed. Indeed, we were between the lines of a battle royal. 
The sonorous thunder of the grinding ice was like the continued volley of artillery. Blocks of ice larger than the house were frequently lifted up a hundred feet by the mighty force of lateral pressure. They would shudder and rock to and fro for a few seconds, then come crashing down with a deafening roar and disappear in the foaming waters. Thus, for more than two hours, the contest of the icy giants continued. It seemed as if the end had come. The ice pressure was terrific, and while we were not caught in the dangerous part of the jam, and were safe for the time being, yet the heaving and rendering of tons of ice as it fell splashing here and there into the watery depths filled us with shaking fear. Finally, to our great joy, the grinding of the ice ceased, and within a few hours the great mass slowly divided, and, as if by an act of providence, had been performed right before us lay an open channel. Should we venture with our little craft into this opening? If the pressure came on again, our little sloop, as well as ourselves, would be crushed into nothingness. We decided to take the chance and, accordingly, hoisted our sail to a favorable breeze and soon started out like a racehorse, running the gauntlet of this unknown narrow channel of open water. For the next 45 days our time was employed in dodging icebergs and hunting channels. Indeed, had we not been favored with a strong south wind and a small boat, I doubt if the story could have ever been given to the world. At last there came a morning when my father said, My son, I think we are to see home. We are almost through the ice. See, the open water lies before us. However, there were a few icebergs that had floated far northward into the open water still ahead of us on either side, stretching away for many miles. Directly in front of us, and by the compass which had now righted itself due north, there was an open sea. What a wonderful story we have to tell the people of Stockholm, continued my father, while a look of pardonable elation lighted up his honest face. And think of the golden nuggets stowed away in the hold. I spoke kind words of praise to my father, not alone for his fortitude and endurance, but also for his courage, daring as a discoverer, and for having made the voyage that now promised a successful end. I was grateful, too, that he had gathered the wealth of gold we were carrying home. While congratulating ourselves on the goodly supply of provisions and water we had on hand, and on the dangers we had escaped, we were startled by hearing a most terrific explosion caused by the tearing apart of a huge mountain of ice. It was a deafening roar like the firing of a thousand cannons. We were sailing at this time with great speed and happened to be near a monstrous iceberg which to all appearances was an immovable as a rock-bound island. It seemed, however, that the iceberg had split and was breaking apart, whereupon the balance of the monster along which we were sailing was destroyed and it began dipping from us. My father quickly anticipated the danger before I realized its awful possibilities. The iceberg extended down into the water many hundreds of feet, and as it tipped over, the portion coming up and out of the water caught our fishing craft like a level of a fulcrum and threw it into the air as if it had been a football. Our boat fell back on the iceberg that by this time had changed the side next to us for the top. My father was still in the boat, having become entangled in the rigging while I was thrown some twenty feet away. I quickly scrambled to my feet and shouted to my father who answered all as well. Just then a realization dawned upon me, horror upon horror. The blood froze in my veins. The iceberg was still in motion and its great weight and force in toppling over would cause it to submerge temporarily. I fully realized what a sucking maelstrom it would produce amid the whirls of water on every side. They would rush into the depression in all their fury like white fang wolves eager for hungry prey. In this supreme moment of mental anguish I remember glancing in our boat which was lying on its side and wondering if it could possibly right itself and if my father could escape. Was this the end of our struggles and adventures? Was this his death? All these questions flashed in my mind in a fraction of a second, and a moment later, I was engaged in a life-and-death struggle. 
The preponderance monolith of ice sank below the surface, and the frigid waters gurgled around me in frenzied anger. I was in a saucer with the waters pouring in on every side. A moment more and I lost consciousness. When I partially recovered my senses and roused from the swoon of a half-drowned man, I found myself wet, stiff, and almost frozen, lying on the iceberg. But there was no sign of my father or of our little fishing sloop. The monster berg had recovered itself and with its new balance lifted its head perhaps fifty feet above the waves. The top of this island of ice was a plateau perhaps half an acre in extent. I loved my father well and was grief-stricken at the awfulness of his death. I railed at fate that I too had not been permitted to sleep with him in the depths of the ocean. Finally I climbed to my feet and looked about me. The purple domed sky above, the shoreless green ocean beneath, and only an occasional iceberg discernible. My heart sank in hopeless despair. I cautiously picked my way through the berg towards the other side, hoping that our fishing craft had righted itself. Dead, I think it possible that my father still lived? It was but a ray of hope that flamed up in my heart, but the anticipation warmed my blood in my veins and started a rushing like some rare stimulant through every fiber of my body. I crept close to the precipitous side of the iceberg and peered far down, hoping, still hoping. Then I made a circle of the berg, scanning every foot of the way, and thus I kept going around and around. One part of my brain was certainly becoming maniacal, while the other part, I believe, and due to this day, was perfectly rational. I was conscious of having made this circuit a dozen times, and while one part of my intelligence knew in all reason there was not a vestige of hope, yet some strange fascinating aberration be bewitched and compelled me still to beguile myself with expectation. The other part of my brain seemed to tell me that while there was no possibility of my father being alive, yet if I quit making this circuitous pilgrimage, if I paused for a single moment, it would be acknowledgment of defeat and, should I do this, I felt that I should go mad. Thus, hour after hour, I walked around and around, afraid to stop and rest yet physically powerless to continue much longer. Oh, horror of horrors, to be cast away in this wide expanse of waters without food or drink, and only a treacherous iceberg for an abiding place. My heart sank within me, and all semblance of hope was fading into black despair. Then the hand of the deliverer was extended, and the death-like stillness of a solitude rapidly becoming unbearable was suddenly broken by the firing of a single gun. I looked up in startled amazement when I saw less than a half a mile away a whaling vessel bearing down toward me with her sail full set. Evidently my continued activity in the iceberg had attracted their attention. On drawing near they put out a boat and descending cautiously to the water's edge I was rescued and a little later lifted on board the whaling ship. I found it was a Scotch whaler, the Arlington. She had cleared from Dundee in September and started immediately for the Antarctic in search of whales. The captain, Angus McPherson, seemed kindly disposed but in matters of discipline, as I soon learned, possessed of an iron will. When I attempted to tell him that I had come from the inside of the earth, the captain and mate looked at each other, shook their heads, and insisted on my being put in a bunk and under strict surveillance of the ship's physician. I was very weak for want of food and had not slept for many hours. However, after a few days' rest, I got up one morning and dressed myself without asking permission of the physician or anyone else and told them that I was as sane as anyone. The captain sent for me and again questioned me concerning where I had come from and how I came to be alone on an iceberg in the far-off Antarctic Ocean. I replied that I had just come from the inside of the earth and proceeded to tell him how my father and myself had gone in by way of Spitzenbergen and come out by the way of the South Pole country, whereupon I was put in irons. I afterwards heard the captain tell the mate that I was as crazy as a March hare and that I must remain in confinement until I was rational enough to give a full truthful account of myself. Finally, after much pleading and many promises, I was released from irons. I then and then there decided to invent some story that would satisfy the captain and never again refer to my trip to the land of the smoky god at least until I was safe among friends. 
Within a fortnight, I was permitted to go about and take my place as one of the seamen. A little later, the captain asked me for an explanation. I told him that my experience had been so horrible that I was fearful of my memory and begged him to permit me to leave the question unanswered until some time in the future. I think you are recovering considerably, he said, but you are not sane yet by a good deal. Permit me to do some work as you may assign, I replied, and if it does not compensate you sufficiently, I will pay you immediately after I reach Stockholm to the last penny. Thus the matter rested. On finally reaching Stockholm, as I have already related, I found that my good mother had gone to her reward more than a year before. I have also told how later the treachery of a relative landed me in a madhouse, where I remained for twenty-eight seemingly unending years, and still later, after my release, how I returned to the life of a fisherman, following it sedulously for twenty-seven years, then how I came to America, and finally to Los Angeles, California. But all this can be of little interest to the reader and listener. Indeed, it seems to me the climax of my wonderful travels and strange adventures was reached when the Scotch sailing vessel took me from an iceberg on the Antarctic Ocean. In concluding this history of my adventures, I wish to state that I firmly believe science is yet in its infancy concerning the cosmology of the Earth. There is so much that is unaccounted for by the world's accepted knowledge of today and will ever remain so until the land of the smoky god is known and recognized by our geographers. It is the land from whence came the great logs of cedar that have been found by explorers in open waters far over the northern edge of the earth's crust and also the bodies of mammoths whose bones are found in vast beds on the Siberian coast. Northern explorers have done much, Sir John Franklin, De Haven Grin Grinnell, Sir John Murray Kane, Melville Hall Nansen, Swatka, Greeley, Peary, Ross, Gerlach, Bernicke, Andre, Amsden, Amundsen, and others have all been striving to storm the frozen citadel of mystery. I firmly believe that Andre and his two brave companions, Strindberg and Frankel, who sailed away in the balloon Orion from the northwest coast of Spitzenbergen on that Sunday afternoon of July 11, 1897, are now in the within world and doubtless are being entertained as my father and myself are entertained by the kind-hearted giant race inhabiting the inner Atlantic continent. Having in my humble way devoted years to these problems, I am very well acquainted with the accepted definitions of gravity as well as the cause of the magnetic needle's attraction and am prepared to say that it is my firm belief that the magnetic needle is influenced solely by electric currents which completely envelop the earth like a garment and that these electric currents in an endless circuit pass out of the southern end of the earth's cylindrical opening, diffusing and spreading themselves over all the outside surface and rushing madly on in their course toward the North Pole. And while these currents seemingly dash off into space at the Earth's curve or edge, yet they drop again to the inside surface and continue their way southward along the inside of the Earth's crust toward the opening of the so-called South Pole. As to gravity, no one knows what it is because it has not been determined whether it is atmospheric pressure that causes the apple to fall or the weather 150 miles below the surface of the earth, supposedly one halfway through the earth's crust, there exists some powerful lodestone attraction that draws it. Therefore, whether the apple, when it leaves the limb of a tree, is drawn or impelled downward to the nearest point of resistance is unknown to the students of physics. Sir James Ross claimed to have discovered the magnetic pole at about 74 degrees latitude. This is wrong. The magnetic pole is exactly one half the distance through the Earth's crust. Thus, if the Earth's crust is 300 miles in thickness, which is the distance I estimate it to be, then the magnetic pole is undoubtedly 150 miles below the surface of the Earth. And at this particular point, 150 miles below the surface, gravity ceases, becomes neutralized, and when we pass beyond that point on towards the inside surface of the Earth, a reverse attraction geometrically increases in power until the other 150 miles of distance is transverse, which would bring us out on the inside of the Earth.
Thus, if a hole were bored down through the Earth's crust at London, Paris, New York, Chicago, or Los Angeles, a distance of 300 miles, it would connect the two surfaces. While the inertia and momentum of a weight dropped in from the outside surface would carry it far past the magnetic center, yet, before reaching the inside surface of the Earth, it would gradually diminish in speed after passing the halfway point, finally pause and immediately fall back toward the outside surface, and continue thus to oscillate like the swinging of a pendulum with the power removed until it would finally rest at the magnetic center or at that particular point exactly one half the distance between the outside surface and the inside surface of the earth. The gyration of the earth in its daily act of whirling around in its spiral rotation at a rate greater than 1,000 miles per hour or about 17 miles per second Make, makes of it a vast electro-generating body, a huge machine, a mighty prototype of the puny man-made dynamo, which at best is but a feeble imitation of nature's original. The valley of this inner Atlantic continent bordering the upper waters of the farthest north are in season covered with the most magnificent and luxuriant flowers, not hundreds and thousands, but millions of acres from which the pollen or blossoms are carried far away in almost every direction by the Earth's spiral gyrations and the agitation of the wind resulting therefrom. And it is these blossoms or pollens from the vast floral meadows within that produce the colored snows of the Arctic regions that have so mystified the northern explorers. Beyond question, this new land within is the home, the cradle of the human race, and viewed from the standpoint of the discoveries made by us, most of necessity have a most important bearing on all physical, paleontological, archaeological, philosophical, philological, and mythological theories of antiquity. The same idea of going back to the land of mystery, to the very beginning, to the origin of man, is found in Egyptian traditions of the earlier terrestrial regions of the gods, heroes, and men, from the historical fragments of Monotho, fully verified by the historical records taken from the most recent excavations of Pompeii as well as the traditions of the Northern American Indians. It is now one hour past midnight, the new year of 1908 is here, and this is the third day thereof, and having at least finished the record of my strange travels and adventures, I wish giving to the world, I am ready and even longing for the peaceful rest which I am sure will follow life's trials and vicissitudes. I am old in years and ripe both with adventures and sorrows, yet rich with the new friends I have cemented to me in my struggles to lead a just and upright life. Like a story that is well nigh told, my life is ebbing away. The present event is strong within me that I shall not live to see the rising of another sun. Thus do I conclude my message. The following is an excerpt from William George Emerson, the author, who writes, It is impossible for me to express my opinion as to the value or reliability of the wonderful statements made by Olaf Jansen. The description here given of the strange lands and people visited by him, location of cities, the names and directions of rivers, and other information herein combined, conform in every way to the rough drawings given into my custody by this ancient Norseman, which drawings together with the manuscripts, it is my intention at some later date to give to the Smithsonian Institute to preserve for the benefit of those interested in the mysteries of the farthest north, the frozen circle of silence. It is certain that there are many things in verdict literature, in Josephus, the Odyssey, the Iliad, Terrian, the Locoperiers, early history of Chinese civilization, Flammarion's astronomical myths, Lenormand's Beginning of History, Hesiod's Theogony, Sir John D. Mandeville's writings, and Sacy's Records of the Past that, to say the least, are strangely in harmony with the seemingly incredible text found in the yellow manuscript of the old Norseman Olaf Jansen, and now for the first time being given to the world. The truth is stranger than fiction.